Welcome to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church. to the king I don't have much to bring my heart is torn in pieces it's my awful me take me to the king truth is I'm tired options are few I'm trying to pray but where are you? I'm all church now Hurt and abuse I can't fake what's left to do you the king I don't have much to bring My heart is torn in peace it's my offering Lay me at the throne Leave me there alone To gaze upon your glory And to sing to you this song Take me to the King Truth is I'm signed this game we need a word for the people's pain so let it speak right now let it pour like rain mm -hmm. we're desperate we're chasing after you no rules no religion I've made my decision to run to you, the healer that I need. Take me to the king, 
I don't have much to bring My heart is torn in pieces It's my offering Take me at the throne Leave me there below To gaze upon your glory And to sing to you this song Take me to the Lord Or in the way We can't make any mistakes The glory's not for us It's all for you to the king I don't have much to bring my heart is torn in pieces it's my offering lay me at the throne leave me there belong to gaze upon your glory and to sing to you this song Take me to the king, 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 take me to the king. This morning's gospel reading is from Mark 6, verses 1 through 13, and you can find it on page 40 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. I'm going to read it a little later on, though, so you might just want to keep your Bible open to it if you care to follow along. There are a lot of theological concepts which we all accept on faith, even though we can't really get our heads around them. The Trinity, God's three natures in one person, the eternal omnipotence of God, in which we believe that God has always existed, knows all things, and has complete power over the universe. The grace of God, which allows forgiveness for our sins, yet still shows perfect justice in God's dealings with us through Jesus Christ. Free will, in which God lovingly allows us to reject God and to make a mess of the world, yet which also allows us to return with merely a hint of faith and repentance. These are all really difficult things to understand. I certainly don't have them all figured out. One of the most difficult concepts to understand is the dual nature of Christ. This is our belief that Jesus was at the same time 100% human and 100% God. That math just doesn't add up, but it's the only equation we have to understand how Jesus did what he did on earth. He had to be completely human in order to take our place on the cross, yet he had to be divine since he came from God and was able to live such a sinless life. And how could a mere human perform all the miracles he did? We need to keep this dual nature of Christ in mind as we read about his life and work. He was tempted and capable of sin, just like us, he had feelings and emotions, just like us. He got angry at the money changers in the temple. He wept over Jerusalem. He grieved when he saw suffering and felt compassion for those in need. He cried real tears and felt real anxiety and fear when faced with the cross. On the other hand, he was the Son of God, divine in nature. He knew the will of God because he was with God in the beginning. He spoke the words of God because he was in complete communion with God. He was able to take my sin upon his back because he was perfectly holy. It's easy to forget that Jesus was human when you read about him in the Gospels. We see the miracles and wonders that he did and realize he was not just your average guy. He could heal sicknesses, even serious ones that were present since birth. He could raise people from death he could cast out demons, he could walk on water, turn water into wine, quiet a storm, and give sight to the blind. He could take a few loaves of bread and a few fishes and make a meal for thousands. Just before our gospel reading this morning, Jesus was on a real roll. 
He calmed a storm at sea, saving himself and his disciples from a watery death. A woman was healed of chronic bleeding just by touching his garment. Jesus told her she had been healed by her own faith. He brought a little dead girl back to life. But listen to what happened next according to Mark. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that he has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed all that, that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Luke, Luke tells the same story, but in his version, Jesus narrowly escapes being thrown over a cliff by an angry mob. Now this is really an interesting situation. Jesus has been building up his ministry and credentials, and he's come back to his hometown, and he runs into a brick wall, unable to do many miracles, and getting run out of town by the very people he grew up with. So does this mean that Jesus' power was useless there? That God was weak? Last week we heard Trevor tell us how little faith could bring about miracles. Today's gospel lesson shows us how a lack of faith can bring them down. Ironically, it is the people who knew Jesus best who made any miracles impossible. These were the people of his hometown, the ones who would know him the best. You'd think they'd be his biggest fans. The story of Jesus returning to his hometown of Nazareth for the first time since he began his public ministry captures all sorts of feelings and frustrations that are associated with bearing witness to Christ in a world that really doesn't want to hear it. At first, there's genuine and probably friendly interest. The local boys made good, a homegrown preacher. Who says that nothing good can come out of Nazareth? This fellow will put our little town on the map. So everyone goes to the synagogue to check him out, and he begins to preach. Very impressive he was. Good strong voice, commanding presence, obvious wisdom and knowledge, an aura of authority about him, a real credit to his parents. The boys doing the town good. I think we can all imagine how, how we would be feel as part of that crowd. But then the mood begins to change. Something's beginning to get their goat. The story doesn't actually tell us what Jesus is saying, but I can imagine that he's probably telling them how the scripture relates to their lives, how they should live. And of course, they pull back. Who does he think he is? He's just a local boy. We know his mom. His brothers are friends of ours. He grew up right here, and we taught him everything he knows. Who does he think he is coming in here telling us how to live? And how does Jesus respond? Prophets are not without honor, except in their own hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. Perhaps the folks of Nazareth were simply too familiar with Jesus, and therefore they couldn't believe that he was the Son of God. They lacked faith in him, and consequently, their lack of faith resulted in a lack of miracles. 
Of course, Jesus could do miracles without the faith of those affected by them, but that's not God's style. If we look at the healing miracles recorded in the Gospels, almost every one of them is done because the sick person or their family or friends showed an incredible amount of faith. Jesus saw the man being lowered down from the roof by his friends, and he rewarded their faith with a healing. He felt the touch of a woman with bleeding, and she was rewarded with healing. But before we judge Jesus' town folk too harshly, let's consider some things. First of all, we know the whole story. They didn't. They'd probably heard some rumors and stories about what Jesus had been doing, but probably very little about what he had been preaching. They may have known that Jesus was baptized and then wandered off into the desert for some time, but they didn't know that he took on Satan head to head and won. We know that even demons recognize Jesus as the Son of God, but they didn't. We've heard the explanations of the parables. They hadn't. We know that Jesus raised a little girl from death, but they didn't because Jesus swore everyone to secrecy. Jesus was always amazed at the faith of the people who came to him for healing and responded with a miracle. And he was amazed in this passage too. He was amazed at the lack of faith. He was able to heal a few sick people, but only because those folks were desperate to believe in Jesus. They had nothing to lose. Their faith enabled their healing. But for those who had grown used to Jesus, who had been, they'd been desensitized by the common sight of seeing him on the street, he could do nothing. Consider the possibility that perhaps we become too used to Jesus. Like a prophet in his hometown, Jesus has become sanitized for our protection. We're the ones who are supposed to know Jesus the best. We've told his story over and over. We sing songs about him. We pray to him. We represent Jesus on earth. But here in the midst of the people who are called in his name, does Jesus really have any power? Do we really have the personal, life-changing relationship with Christ that he wants us to have? Just like the people in Jesus' hometown, maybe we've grown a little too used to Jesus. Our worship is planned out to the minute. We have our service carefully laid out in our bulletins with little room for the Holy Spirit to work. We have religion, but do we have the true relationship with the living God? Are we amazed and in awe of the power of Jesus' name? Jesus doesn't waste any time, though, mulling over the unbelief in his hometown. Mark tells us he went right out teaching and preaching in the surrounding villages. The disciples had followed him to Nazareth, and I'm sure they followed him when he left, learning ministry themselves. Actually, they were probably glad to get out of Nazareth. So Jesus called the twelve together, and you couldn't wish for a more motley, ordinary bunch of folk than them, and sends them out two by two to proclaim the gospel and cast out demons and disease. And he tells them to go about it pretty much empty-handed. Don't take any food, luggage, or money. Just a staff, their sandals, and one set of clothes. I think we struggle with that. Those guys are us. We're supposed to be on Jesus' team. But we really don't want to identify ourselves with the twelve at that point. But Mark has set us up. He's built up the story that we have to choose sides. And as soon as we do, he tells us that our side is sent out to proclaim the gospel and to overcome evil and sickness. Jesus, are you really talking about us? You don't really want to send the likes of us out to do that stuff, do you? That's not a job for Presbyterians. Send the Baptists. I don't know about you all, but I'm certainly not just real at home with that evangelism thing. I feel awkward witnessing. I'm afraid of rejection and being thought a fanatic or a fool. But Jesus prepares us for that too. Jesus got those same responses even in his own hometown. We are told that if we have, have faithfully borne witness to the gospel in word and deed and people refuse to hear us, we should just move on, shake the dust off our feet, and keep bearing witness somewhere else. And we need to remember that we bear witness just, just, not just by beating folks with the Bible and telling them to repent. We bear witness daily in everything that we do. We also have to remember that we're not responsible for the results. 
And of course, we're responsible if the reason people don't listen is because we're rude, intolerant, or unloving. Was Jesus responsible for the reaction of the Nazarenes? Not hardly. So if we faithfully witness in word or deed, we're no more responsible for the results. We're simply called to bear witness. We're not called to make people believe and respond. That's God's work through the Holy Spirit. As Jesus taught us in the parables of the sower, we scatter the seeds and some of them grow. We don't know how they grow, why, that's not our problem. The Spirit alone is the giver of life and the Spirit alone is responsible for whether the seeds grow or not. Others may water and nurture the seeds. Someone else may cultivate and pull some weeds. We may at times find ourselves in any one of those roles, but the ultimate responsibility for success or failure belongs to the Holy Spirit, not us. There will always be times when we plant and there's no harvest and we may feel inadequate. We shouldn't. Our adequacy is measured only in our bearing witness, not in the results that arise from it. No matter how weak and inadequate we feel in the face of this acceptance, lack of acceptance, we can keep on trusting God and keep bearing witness. As Paul wrote in our reading from the Corinthians, God's grace is sufficient for us, and God's power is made known in our weakness. And so Paul is happy to cope with weaknesses insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ, for it is in our weakness that we discover strength. Although, although we are sent out on mission empty-handed, Jesus has provided strength for us and tools for the task. We gather here around this table from time to time because Jesus has invited us to prepare ourselves for mission there. Jesus gave himself that we might be strengthened and sustained in our calling. Amen. Thank you.